Hello, my name's Phil Scott. Uh, I'm from NVIDIA. Um, and I was uh, asked to come here by Unity to talk to you about VR. Um, so kind of a bold statement to start off with. Um, VR is going to deliver some amazing experiences. Um, and so just as a quick show of hands, how many people in the audience are actually VR developers? That's great. That's great. Um, so you know, you guys kind of know what VR is already about. You kind of already ride in the future wave, and and it, it's kind of one of those things. As our place in this is is to try and make your job in this as easy as possible. Um, so as part of those wild experiences, um, this is a, this is a project that I've been able to work on myself, and you know. In VR, what you're going to be able to do is you're going to be able to take people to parts of the world that they'd never physically be able to go to. You know, it, it's a real human endeavor to go to the top of Everest. You know, and, and this is the kind of visuals that you can actually achieve in VR. Um, so, you know, there's been a lot of talk about non-photorealistic rendering is the only thing that you can do in VR. Um, and, and this is kind of proof that, that you can't. This is actually a real um, stereophotogrammetry model of the real mountain. Uh, it was generated by 300,000 photographs um, and then, then computed all together. Now, putting somebody in VR at the top of a mountain is kind of interesting, right? Because what they, what they achieve is they achieve presence in immersion and, and just the sheer splendor of something that's, you know, 30,000 feet high um, is, is pretty amazing. Um, and, and those are the sorts of goals that we want for VR. So putting somebody in, you know, in, in a helmet and then sticking them on top of a mountain is, is kind of a strange thing to do. Um, and what we found when people first try this thing is they, they, they get a few other sensations, right? Which is fear, tension, and vertigo. Now, I've never personally played a video game before where I've actually felt vertigo. Yet, um, certainly with this, what we've had is we, the, there's a part where you have to cross the mountain on a rope bridge. And we've actually had people who literally get to the edge of the rope bridge and go, uh, and they literally can't take a step further. Now, as, as far as a real explorer goes, the, the, you know, these guys are kind of used to doing daring things, but to the everyday person, that's putting them in that situation. That's, that's a physical, like, I can't do that. I physically can't do that. So, so raising that, that fear and tension and vertigo is actually a good thing within the premise of this, this game. So what we need to do is we need to learn how to build games and experiences to actually harness these sensations in a, you know, in, in, in a, in a good way, you know, to give people just enough, to give people something where they feel comfortable but edgy, you know, um, and possibly a, an experience of this is a fairground ride. Okay, so it's like you look at the big roller coaster and you know you're safe. Right? You know you're going to be safe, but you look at it and you stare at it and you go like, wow, I'm going to die. You know? so, so one of the things you do is, is you, you kind of look at that fairground experience, you go like you give people short bursts of something scary and interesting. So the other thing that comes with this is people tend to feel a bit sick on a fairground ride. Okay? So, because what you're doing is you're actually putting people to the comfort zone, right? You're taking them from the comfort zone and you're kind of taking them to the edge. And, you know, as they get a bit closer to the edge, it's like, ooh, I'm not so sure about that. But it's risky and people like adrenaline. So, one of the things that you've got to deal with is, is giving people too much too quick. You know, so you kind of have to educate the player into the VR experience. Um, but a lack of consistency is actually something else that's a bit of a problem because whatever you present them, you kind of have to be consistent in the language that you present that, that, that world to the player. So you can't have something that looks photorealistic in one scope and then completely Mickey Mouse in, in another scope. So that's something that you have to be very careful of. Uh, and then just plain bad implementations tend to make everybody not very well. So you kind of want to avoid that. And a part of this, uh, which, which we were kind of hypothesizing about, which was uh, how long does the VR experience actually last for? Um, you know, we've heard people say five minutes, 10 minutes, an hour, days. Um, so what would it be? But to be honest, it's, it's, 
Would you ride that for a day? Would you want to go on this giant spinning thing for a day? Because it would probably make you feel unwell after minutes, let alone hours or days. So you, you kind of have to present, present the VR world in, in a way where you're giving people bits and you kind of pace it and, you know, it, it's like educating the players. And if you think all the way back all those years to when first person shooters were around, everybody would go, oh, the field of view, I feel sick. Right? Now, first person shooters now are common. Right? And people have learned to play them, and we've learned to present first-person shooters in such a way that people feel okay. Um, so, you know, this is kind of the preamble to some of the stuff that we're going to talk about. So, there is a challenge. And with VR, there is a very, very, very big challenge, right? Which is, it's actually hard. Okay? Now, Unity makes it easier, but actually making real VR worlds is actually really, really hard. Um, and actually simulating reality, which is what effectively you're trying to do, or you're trying to present an alternative reality, is actually a massive challenge. And this is graphics and audio and touch and simulation. It, it, it's, it's hard. So, so, you know, the challenges that we face from traditional games, okay, you're doing a lot more. And then you're doing a lot more a lot faster. So to put this into perspective, um, to have an immersive experience, you're typically looking at somewhere between six and seven times as much work you've got to do to be consistent. You know, um, you know a typical PC game wants to run at around about 60 hertz. You know, it, it's virtual reality is 90 hertz, drawn at real detail, drawn twice, left eye, right eye. And as far as I'm aware, there's no monocles for VR yet. So I think we've got to draw it twice. There's no corner cutting. We've just drawn it once yet. So, so what we have to do is, is we have to look at this in, in real terms. W what can we do to try and improve the VR experience? Um, you know, VR requires ultra low latency. You know, it needs, you know, from the moment that, that you move your head to the point where that next frame is displayed right, right here, it's actually really, really important to get that. And we're, 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 talking about, we're talking about motion to photons in under 20 milliseconds. You know, th this, this, is, this is a huge amount of work that has to be done. And you know, anything that we can do to try and speed that along is a good thing. So kind of the graphics 101. Um, I wasn't sure kind of how many people were graphics programmers and not graphics programmers and that kind of thing. So, you know. We create some geometry, we project that into a view, and then we calculate the pixels, the color, and the textures, that kind of thing. Um, and, and that's a traditional graphics pipeline. Now, in the VR world, we don't have this flat screen anymore. What we have on here is we, we still render to flat screens. I mean, you know, until somebody's got a curved screen in front of them, uh, we're going to be stuck with flat displays for a while. Um, we're going to be taking this, this rendered image, and then we're going to be applying some kind of warp to it. And by applying that, that warp to it, we're kind of throwing stuff away. Okay? We've got all this, this black area around the outside here. So all of this is thrown away. Right? It's the same image that, that's actually rendered here. So what can we do to speed that up? Well, to kind of visualize this, um, you know, the, the center area of the screen, which is in the green circle, um, the, the center area of the screen typically is rendered a roughly one-to-one -one ratio um, because that's the point where the lens has it, most of its effect. And even normal glasses, I wear glasses, um, and, and normal glasses tend to make you look through the center of the, the, center of the glasses. You tend not to look around inside the glasses. Um, whereas around the edges, you know, we've got this, this quite sizable box here, this, this red box, I'm not sure how easy it is to see at the back. Um, and, and what we're doing is we're taking that and, and we're actually projecting that into this curved space. And you can see that's quite significantly smaller than, than, than what we've done. So we're not getting a one-to-one -one mapping of pixels um, to the final display. So there's got to be something that we can do here that, that, that improves that. So we came up with a technology a couple of years ago called multi-resolution shading. Now, what multi-resolution shading does, it, it applies this coarse grid to the display. Um, 
the centerpiece remains at full resolution, and then around these, these peripheral boxes, we render these at lower resolutions. So what this means is, is this area here is, is always rendered in that one-to-one -one ratio. Um, and then, then these, these supplemental areas here, um, are, are effectively, it gives us that ability to deal with them like a mipmap almost. Um, but the real trick that, that we have in hardware is that we draw all of this at once. This isn't drawn these little boxes multiple times. We actually draw all of these at once. Um, so it's not like you're taking the hit for resubmitting everything to the, the draw sequence. You're not having to recall everything. Um, that, that's taken care of by the hardware. Um, so this was, this was cool, um, but there is still some artifacts to it. Um, so what, what we were wanting to do was, was come up with something a little bit smarter. Now, what we came up with was this thing called lens match shading. What lens match shading does is it effectively creates the, the fall off as a concentric, a concentric effect. So effectively matching the ratio of the pixel loss to the lens. Um, so as you can see, we've, we've got something that's a bit more curved, curved in, this, in this image. Um, and, and essentially, the original, the original image is still here, and the lens match shaded image is, is across here. And, and it's, we actually do a little bit more than just rasterizing four triangles. Um, but what, what, what we're actually seeing is, is something that, that actually matches the, the shape of the lens a lot more. So we can actually tune this as well. This isn't fixed. Um, and the lens match shading element of this is, is you know, different HMDs have different lens ratios. Um, so we want to be able to match those as close as possible. Um, and different games have different needs, um, so it is fully tunable. So in addition to this, there's this thing about, you know, we have to render everything twice. Um, so there's been different approaches to this. Some people talk about instance, and some people talk about, you know, other things. Um, one of the options that we have is to actually render the left eye and the right eye uh, together. So in, in traditional rendering, you would render the left eye once, and then in the second pass, you would render the right eye. What, we, what we've actually created now uh, with the Pascal hardware, which we, we launched a couple of weeks ago, is we can actually render the left eye and the right eye simultaneously. Um, and we actually just put an extra coordinate into, into the space so we, we actually know what the, the left eye and right eye separation is, and then we can refocus that to a focal point in the distance. Um, the, this, this in itself can then also be matched with lens match shading, um, so you shouldn't realistically be bound by draw calls. Uh, you shouldn't realistically be bound by uh, CPU performance in the submission process because you're actually going down to once. Um, and, then, and then on top of that, you've got the lens match shading benefits uh, on top of that. So lens match shading and single pass stereo. So this, this is something kind of that we've been doing with, with the HMD manufacturers. Um, the, the game developers themselves um, don't, don't get a great deal of sort of knowledge that this is going on, but I thought we'd talk about it a little bit. Um, and actually reducing the latency um, for comfortable VR is really important. Um, you know, comfortable VR is, is an absolute godsend in the VR experiences because I've tried all sorts of VR games, both great and not so great. Um, and, and inevitably, the, the actual latency is the thing that makes me feel ill, more than anything else. So typically, what we're dealing with with the latency is um, the, the typical loop would be sample the head pose, do some work, draw some stuff, scan that out to the display. That is the traditional thing. And along the bottom, from the point where you sample the head pose all the way through to the point where it actually hits the panel is latency. And this can be actually quite a long time. So we want to do something that, that, that improves that. So we've done multiple things. So Maxwell, which is the previous generation, which is the GeForce 9X generation, um, that, that did some latency compensation. With, with Pascal, it does even more. So VR latency with time warp. Time warp is, is essentially a, a a resampling of the head pose closer towards the end of the sequence. Okay, so you know, 
we basically resample this a few milliseconds before the vertical sync, um, and then apply a warp to the image, uh, and it, it cuts the perceived latency down. So it means that we can actually apply that, that final little shift to the final, the final image. Um, the, this can create some artifacts. You know, they're, they're very minor, but it, it, it's startlingly effective. Um, it, it's surprising how much this actually cuts down on the actual latency aspect of things. In Pascal, we can actually preempt this, and we can actually call things out at, um, at the pixel level. Um, so to perform the time warp, we need to be able to interrupt things very, very quickly. Um, so we apply contracts priority to this. Um, and, and generally speaking, this just improves the actual experience. So time warp with Maxwell, when it's visualized, um, is we've got this kind of conservative preemption request. Um, and and it, it comes, through, comes through the pipeline. Um, you know, it needs to come slightly earlier than the theoretical limit, uh, just because of, there's an amount of variability um, for the time it takes for the draw call to actually physically finish. With Pascal, uh, this, this changes a little bit. So with the Pascal, um, with the support for preemption, we can interrupt the GPU uh, on a much finer granularity, um, just basically about, you know, allowing us to reduce the, the amount of time that it takes to get to scan out. Um, and get that final preemption into the pipeline. So again, massively reducing the amount of latency. So in theory, making people a lot more sort of, a lot more well uh, after they've been playing VR games. Um, so to kind of sum up the VR work stuff, um, you know, it's faster pixel shading with lens mass shading. You know, you, it's just an, a win. And you can get some significant wins. I mean, we've seen in some games, this is up to a 50% pixel rate win with lens mass shading. It, it's a significant win. And if you, what you're trying to do is trying to have higher quality at lower end, this is one of the ways to do it. Uh, if you've got ge greater geometric detail, obviously single pass stereo, it saves on getting that amount of geometry through. Um, and then on the HMD side, which is something that you don't necessarily need to do anything about, um, it's faster time warp. Um, the main thing is, is you've got to do everything that you have to do to try and make this smooth, rich, and virtually real. Uh, for the VR developers in the room, how many people spend time actually optimizing stuff rather than developing new stuff? Yeah, there's at least one guy down here. There's another one over there. Yeah, I feel your pain. I feel your pain a lot, and he's smiling. He knows I'm right. Um, and it, it's actually very true. You, you know, the, the optimization and the, OK, we'll switch that off. That's, that's kind of one of the big things. So with the new generation, Right? This is kind of a seismic jump in terms of performance and power, and even price for that matter. Um, you know, we need to be able to cater for these, these other generations of VR. Um, VR works, you know, it's a compre comprehensive suite of, of things that we actually have. So the main things that we've been talking about are on this side. Um, there is some stuff about audio and physics uh, that I don't have time to cover here, but I would encourage you to actually come by our booth um, later on, if you want to talk more about VR audio. Um, so Unity has actually announced support for VR works at GDC. Um, and it's going to be available in Unity soon. Um, I would encourage you to talk to your Unity rep uh, as to how you get a hold of this. Um, because Unity will, will be the ones that actually distribute this. Um, now, the call to action here is actually build scalable games. Don't lock yourself into that bottom tier, those shadows that you just optimized out and switched off. Switch them back on on better hardware. You know, give yourself some headroom. Give yourself something that actually makes a difference. Um, because you know, the VR world is not going to stand still. It's moving at such a rapid rate of knots that, that being able to, to say, it looks good here, it looks better here. But you know when you go to a trade show and you want to show this thing off, and you've got a journalist who wants to try it? Journalists typically don't have poor hardware. They want to have great hardware. They want to be able to see the game in its very best possible light. So by doing that, you can, you can effectively get better review scores. That usually leads to more sales. Multi-res shading and lens match shading, um, they do deliver these significant speed ups. I mean, this is based on multi-res. Um, you know, you can't leave performance like this on the table. You know, there, there's a very simple thing here. It, it's like, yeah, make my game fall fa go faster. Tick. I'll have some of that. 
Um, you know, and, and building scalable games, building scalable games is something I'm very passionate about myself. It's like, you know, I've worked at NVIDIA a long time, um, and I really don't like people to just hit me in spec. You know, I like to see people do amazing things. Um, you know, we build hardware to try and make, make aspirational content. Um, so, you know, start switching stuff on. Give it some work to do. Uh, there's plenty of headroom in the GPU to be able to do some of this. And, you know, going back to that Everest demo, um, that was actually started on a Titan X with everything switched on. We've now managed to get it so it, virtually all of it runs on a GeForce 970. Um, but there's also a load more stuff going in for that, you know, the big boy experience. Now, with Unity, one of the things that you can do this with is the Unity quality settings. So who's familiar with this? It's like, you know, the, the bottom ones make my game look awesome. It shouldn't be called fantastic. It's make my game look awesome. Um, and you can actually add, add your own defaults to this. So these things are editable. Um, you know, for the VR experience, that's typically locked to a certain platform, so you can actually physically give people, um, you know, presets for certain things. Um, and you can add your own, add your own quality levels. You know, you should be able to give quite a decent scope of quality levels for VR. Um, and the, the, you know, VR is only going to get wider and wider and wider as more hardware comes out from ourselves and everybody else. Now, one of the other things that you can do, um, the asset store is a great place to save your bacon. Um, you know, you can, you can go there and you can get these things and you can actually add them in. You know, it's like, how many people have been optimizing VR and switched off shadows and switched off bloom and switched, switched off everything else pretty much just to try and get to a frame rate that you can develop and not feel ill? There's probably been a number of people that have done that. Um, you know, don't forget to switch this stuff back on. Um, and if you want more qualitative stuff, um, we've got stuff like HBAO. Um, so this is like implicit ambient shadows. Um, this is freely available in Unity. Um, you, can, you, know, you can just download it, get at it, stick it in. It's trivial to add. Um, but it's a qualitative thing that you want to be able to add uh, and, and just generally, you know, generally make the game feel richer. If you look at all of the games that typically get the column inches for VR, they're either one of two things. They're either they do something really funky with the controls, or they look really good. The middle ground doesn't really get that much coverage. So, you know, if you haven't got a funky control scheme, make it look great. So effects, you know, again, Unity has an absolutely awesome particle editor. Um, for making effects, and you can quite easily transition these things out with prefabs, um, you know, and again have a good, better, best. You know, th those types of things are actually really, really, really important um, just for that quality bar and the physical immersion. And the, with the Everest demo, we added um, particles that you can actually interact with, and you can stick your hands through the particles, which is snow. Um, and the feeling of immersion, because you're interacting with the world and you're able to move things around. Um, is, is staggering. And we had one journalist who came to us and said it was actually the first time that he'd actually felt true presence um, on the top of a mountain. And he was kind of scared because he also had vertigo. Um, so it was job done. You know, we like that kind of thing. Um, but, but, you know, being able to just interact with the particles because they don't have weight, and that, that's actually one of the bigger issues that you have is, is is obviously you push against something in, in the VR world, your hands just kind of go through it like a ghost. Um, whereas with particles, you can actually interact with them in a good way because they typically don't have any weight whatsoever. Um, so that's, that's another good way to actually try and get, you know, get some immersion in there. Um, so kind of drawing this, um, drawing this to a close a little bit. Um, you know, we are doing a lot of stuff with VR. Uh, we, we want to help you make amazing things. Um, there's an absolute ton of resources on here. Um, you know, we spend a lot of time actually making sure that, that these resources are up to date. Uh, we're putting new stuff up there for VR all the time. Um, you know, Unity is an awesome platform for VR. Uh, we're doing an awful lot of work to make sure that your life is actually easier uh, developing for VR with Unity. Um, 
you know, so the, the VR work stuff will be sometime soon. Uh, there isn't a date yet for it, um, but it'll be sometime soon and you'll literally be able to switch it on. That's the whole, the whole idea. You'll be able to switch it on, try it, you like it, you love it, ship it. Um, and the other thing is come and talk to us. Uh, both me and my colleague Alexi are here. Um, if, you, you know, if, you, if you want to talk to us about VR, if you're making something interesting or great or awesome, um, you know, please talk to us about VR. Um, we, we are really, really passionate about this and we really, really want to make sure that, that you don't have any roadblocks in making whatever you want to make. Uh, and with that, I will say thank you.